All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for today's CNCF Live webinar, Uncovering Hidden OTEL Traces Leverage in a Standardized Manner. I'm Libby Schultz, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand things over to Steve Waterworth from Asserts and Taylor Dolezal, Head of Ecosystem at CNCF. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to speak as an attendee, but there is a chat box on the right sidebar where you can say hello, tell us where you're watching from, and leave all of your questions here. We'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct and please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and our presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF Online Programs page at community.cncf.io under Online Programs. They're also available via your registration link you used to join today and will be available on our Online Programs YouTube playlist. With that, I'll hand things over to Steven Taylor to kick off today's presentation. Take it away. Awesome. Well, howdy, howdy, and welcome, everyone. Uh, like Libby said, if you have any questions at all during the session, please feel free to throw those into chat, and we'd love to surface those and get to as many as we possibly can. I'm really excited to be joined by Steve from Asserts, and Hi. we're going to be covering a lot of things as it pertains to open source, and uh, really would just love to dive in and get started. Uh, one project that I've heard quite a bit about from many folks has been open telemetry, also referred to as OTEL uh, for short. So Steve, uh, oh, tell me more. I'd love to hear about open telemetry. Oh, very good. What is yes, it? But, but that jokes continue. <laughs> uh, yeah, so open telemetry is, uh, is a vendor agnostic, truly open uh, observability tool set. Uh, trivia fact for you, it is the second most popular uh, project in the CNCF as far as sort of code, source code activity with commits uh, and the like, second only to Kubernetes. So there's a, there's a lot happening with it. Uh, where we're predominantly interested in it is from the tracing side of things, as, as we know with the cloud native applications, microservices and the like. Uh, being able to do distributed tracing can be a very good diagnostic tool when things aren't maybe going quite as well as you'd hoped they might. I find it funny that the uh, second most popular project in the CNCF uh, portfolio right now is one focused on telemetry and observability. And so it's great to see that it's doing so well in that space and that folks just want to know what's going on. Um, one other project that I've seen that paired quite often with kind of like chocolate and peanut butter uh, has been Prometheus. Uh, is, is that one that you can kind of talk a little bit more about? Oh, I'm not going to talk about chocolate and peanut butter. I'm not sure that's a good pairing, but there we go. <laughs> Each to their own. <laughs> yeah, so Promethe Prometheus is sort of the flip side, really. Uh, that's all about time series metrics. And it's probably one of the more mature project projects in CNCF. If I just uh, flick over to my crib sheet, just to be absolutely certain, but I think it's sort of it graduated in like 2018, something like that. Yes, it did, it graduated in 2018. So it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a mature project and by no means stale. I think it ranks as number seven as the most active project in the, in the CNCF. So uh, yeah, it's still very much up there, still very, very active. Let's say that's all about getting time series metrics. Metrics are really at the heart of any observability platform or, or solution that you're building. Everything's, I think, is really driven by metrics. That's the way you start, and then you hop off into, into logs and tracing. It's, it's been interesting to see what folks are using Prometheus to measure, and it seems kind of like a uh, dark art for some uh, when it comes <laughs> to figuring out the right way to craft their perfect dashboard or their single pane of glass. So I know that, that can be a little bit difficult for some folks, but I feel like once you have that set up, you have a really good view into the things you actually want to see. And then uh, we, I know we use that at the CNCF for things like dev stats, uh, looking at those various projects and folks, companies, and other uh, types of observability as it comes to our projects, who's contributing to them, 
what the project health might look like and some metrics there. So I, I know that we're, yes, biased, but very happy to have the project because it <laughs> helps provide a lot of insights on that. Yeah, for me, this is great because it's very easy to get it set up and running, particularly if you're running it as, as a container uh, or you can, it's, not, it's not a difficult install if you're running it to, natively on the uh, on the operating system. So it's very easy to get Prometheus up and running in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, using the Prometheus operator is an absolute no brainer. That's like the easiest way. It's a simple Helm install and you're there. Uh, so yeah, getting those metrics in and there's a whole bunch of exporters for, for various uh, other software components and a lot of other CNCF projects expose a Prometheus metrics endpoint by default anyway. So it's very quick and easy to get Prometheus running and fill it up with a few million metrics on absolutely everything. And of course, it doesn't just have to be, as you've already alluded to, it doesn't just have to be uh, bits and bytes and com computery things. It can be business type metrics as well. You can you can measure the you know the average cart size if you're a if you're an e-commerce platform or the number of items in a car, anything like that. It's, I, I really like as well that within each of those components that you're able to take a look at Prometheus, you can actually inspect the data in many cases and even download that in CSV or other types of formats as well and continue to work with it if you might not like your view or you might be locked to a specific view within your organization as well. I'm not sure if you have any uh, Easter eggs or tips or tricks when it comes to yeah the uh, Yeah, this is sort of starting to get to now the sort of the... the one of the challenges with with implementing these open source solutions, you know, it's it's you know, particularly with with Prometheus, it's very easy, as I said, you know, to get a bucket of two million metrics. Uh, the problem is now you need to get information out of it. You know, just the data is not information; it needs to be processed to turn it into into information. And then this is yeah, where the hard work really begins. You, you suddenly find, ah, yes, yes. I, th I thought I was done when I had everything installed and all my scrape <laughs> configs set up. Uh, right, uh, yeah, I've now got to start building health rules because I want to get alerted against things and I want to be able to see the data. So I've now got to start building a whole bunch of dashboards and I want to be able to link from one dashboard to another. So I've got to build all those links in to match my topology. And you realize that actually getting it installed and setting up a scrape config was the first step on a very, very long and never ending journey. <laughs> it's, it's so true. It's, it's, uh, it's, I like that it at least gives you a framework to iterate on. And, uh, you know, it's what looks good or is relevant to you right now might not always be the case. So giving you that ability to change things and make it modular mm -hmm. in that case is quite helpful. And, and like you said, I've seen people use it for, all kinds of wild things from uh, tracking all of the times that, you know, you fed the dog or gone on a walk or, you know, measuring personal fitness and in, in anything else in that category. It's yeah. really fascinating to see all the different ways in which people use that. So uh, yeah, I, of, actually, I actually use it personally as well in a you know, little home automation projects. Uh, my wife's a keen gardener. So we like monitor the temperature in the greenhouse and rainfall <laughs> and all this. And it's all just metric data. Yeah. And we, this goes into Prometheus. There, um, there was one group in, uh, in or just outside the Bay Area, Napa Valley, and I, I, I had a friend send me some uh, images, but this uh, winery actually uses it to measure uh, soil, uh, like wetness and humidity mm -hmm. and all of these other things too. And they have all of these uh, Prometheus graphs up on, uh, like projected onto their little like IMAX-esque Oh, cool. uh, little uh, viewing deck. So really cool, really cool and wild way to see people using that. Yeah. And then because the, you know, the challenges don't stop there, because then you know, we're talking about observability and there's more to observability than just metrics. Metrics are certainly your starting point. But as we've said, we've got with, with Otel, we've got the traces. Uh, and you know, logging is as old as the hills. Most organizations will already have some logging solution, uh, be it open source or, or proprietary. Uh, there's, there's pretty good chance that, that logging will already be there. So then the challenge becomes is how do you how do you tie it all together? You want to be able to be alerted on something when a, when a, when a, maybe a metric isn't uh, in the value that we we hope it 
should be, you know, like increased latency or excessive resource consumption. And you want to dive into that. And then you want to be able to go and look at the traces for the transaction for that or the logs from the container. How do you, how do you pull all that to all that together? And that's where it gets really difficult doing that manual correlation, particularly then when with distributed systems, when a single request will could hit you know a dozen different microservices in, in, and possibly in different Kubernetes clusters, maybe even in in different data centers. So how do you how do you pull all that together? And that's sort of the work that that Asserts has been doing, is to add that layer of intelligence and automation on top of these great open source tools to help you pull it all together. Now, yeah, sure you can do it manually, but hey. Having a having something help you uh, help you do it uh, makes life a lot easier and saves you, you know, not an inconsiderable amount of time, effort, blood, sweat, and tears. We we talked a little bit about how folks are using Open Telemetry and Prometheus, but I think one thing, and you've covered this a little bit, but I'd like to dive deeper into why uh, people are using those those solutions for their problems. Yeah, I think the. The key area there is is you're you're avoiding that vendor lock-in. The with the open source tooling, it's so good now. You, there's no requirement to pay for proprietary agents. You've been able to collect observability data and store it, and that is that is commoditized. You you can do that very easily and at, at minimal cost. Obviously, it doesn't run in thin air, so there's a bit of compute cost somewhere. But yeah, you certainly don't have to be paying uh, licenses off to an organization in order to collect observability data. And in fact, in many cases, the, obser- the, you know, the free tools are better than the proprietary tools in that there's no limits on the custom metrics that you can have. And also the maturity of the and range of collectors that are out there, again, is, is often surpassing what is available commercially. And I think that while it might be in some cases a little bit more difficult to set up the things that you care about initially, you're going to have that much longer term satisfaction, uh, especially around that cost as well. You know, just a little bit to go through the wall the first time, but afterwards, uh, fairly smooth sailing, keeping up with the nautical terminology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, when people are uh, using Open Telemetry and Prometheus, what kinds of challenges have you, you seen folks run into? Yeah, so as I said, once you've sort of broken free from that license cost, you've been you've embraced open source, you've got all this fantastic data. We've already touched on you know turning that data into information is a challenge. There's a there's a lot of work there. And then the the correlation aspect of it, it, it been able to pull data from different places and, and have it all related to maybe to, to the uh, issue you're working on. And then the uh, one of the other challenges, well, is also data volume, because it is so easy to go collect all this data. You end up uh, then paying a penalty on storage costs, particularly around tracing. Uh, you know, metrics are tiny. I think Prometheus is about one and a half bytes, something like that per per sample. If you have a look at their documentation, but yeah. Tracing is uh, is much more well the the worst offender there with uh, you know, with a, with a span being about two k. By the time you've got all the baggage in it, and then a particular transaction may be like 12, 12 spans. So you can soon be into sort of a few kilobytes uh, per trace, and then you've got millions, if not billions, if you're a busy site of traces. That's very quickly a lot of data and yeah, a lot of storage cost and, and processing power as well. So yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's gotta be a better way of, of doing it. And what most people come across is like, oh, oh this is a lot of data. Oh, we can't possibly trace everything. Uh, what we need to do is some sampling and yeah, Hotel offers various sampling strategies, but they're all a bit of a blunt instrument. You can say, well, I'll just take 10%. Uh, which is great, but then Murphy's Law comes to, comes to the fore and says, oh, when there's a problem, yeah, the traces I need were the ones that weren't sampled, so I'm still blind. I think when, when so we've heard a lot about open telemetry as well, and I remember early days of folks focusing on tracing and being told, like, 
you can set up tracing, but it's something that you have to instrument your application for. Have you seen that change when it comes to open telemetry and the amount of effort needed to get started in looking at function calls and, and kind of delving a little bit deeper when it comes to adopting open telemetry? Yeah, open telemetry has done done a lot of work on the on the tracing. Now, it is the second most active project, and there's a lot of automation in there now. It's tends to be very much language specific. Some languages you know, make them make themselves easier to uh, instrument automatically, and they have some more of the compiled languages like Go, those types of things. They're they're a little more difficult to do, but certainly something like Java, which has had a a standard for for the Java agent since like about Java 1.5, if you remember that far back. Uh, so there's a standard API for it. So it's very easy to automatically instrument your Java application. Say so some of the others, the automation is maybe uh, you know, not quite as advanced, but certainly for things like Go, there's a whole bunch of middleware. So if you're using Gorilla or Jin to do your request routing, there's wrappers for that. So yeah, it's manual effort, but it's like changing two lines of code. It's it's not a huge effort. It's not like you've got to go and hit every single uh, request endpoint and put in a dozen lines for each one. It's uh, just one wrapper. I think that's nice. It's uh, I, I know we've also gotten a little bit further along with things like uh, transparent proxies for service meshes and those kinds of concerns as well. So great to know that it doesn't take as much time or effort to get those things instrumented and we're starting to see more capability right out of the box. Yeah, that's another approach is using the service mesh, you do the, the, like ITSEO and, and LinkD, both of those guys you can configure and they'll spit out hotel spans as they're routing the traffic across the mesh. So that's, an, that's another, you know, another way of doing it. Um, it's an added layer of complexity. It's you know, like all things in engineering, the swings and roundabouts you, you gain in that you haven't got to go and uh, reconfigure each service manually, but then you're adding another layer of complexity with a service mesh. But then a service mesh can do lots of funky things for you as well. So. <laughs> I, I saw a question come in uh, asking, open tracing is now within open telemetry? Uh, and yes, uh, I yes. think that was a, a really interesting part of the, the history of the project, too, if you want to go mm -hmm. into that, too, Steve. Yeah, well, oh, dear. Yeah, now you're going back into the dim mists of time uh, <laughs> in computing speak anyway, probably like a year ago in, in real time. Yeah, so, so open tracing was probably the first uh, open standard for doing distributed tracing. Uh, and uh, a lot of, uh, actually, a lot of the commercial products are actually built on top of those uh, hotel standards, um, open tracing standards. And then, yeah, <clears throat> open telemetry came, came along and it has, it has a broader remit than just distributed tracing. It does, it does also include metrics and logs, although the, the support for metrics and logs isn't as mature as it is for tracing. If you actually go and look at the various project statuses, uh, most of them are pretty much there you know, with mainline releases uh, general availability releases on the tracing side and you look at metrics and logs and these are still still a lot of alphas and betas and oh, don't deploy this in production type uh, caveats on it. So yeah, it's certainly, so it absorbed um, the, the open tracing standards into open telemetry. Amazing. It's, it's wild to look back and see which projects within the CNCF have gotten merged or archived and, and things of that nature. I, I remember reading about was it open census and open tracing and being really excited uh, uh, back, back uh, also yes. back in the, the dim mists of time when, when I was working at Walt Disney Studios and got really excited seeing those things but it's like, uh, it's so many projects to kind of put together. And so now seeing those culminated together as one as open telemetry, I think was really helpful. Same thing, you know, uh, continuing to modify what's needed and uh, really focusing on adaptability and usability within the mm -hmm. project is really great to see them move in that direction. Yeah, I also like the concept they have with the open telemetry collector. So this is sort of acts as like a like a patch board, best way to describe it, I suppose. In that you your various services or your service mesh uh, sends the data to the collector. So it has you can set up various receivers there in the collector. So it'll it'll receive the metrics and span and trace spans 
And then optionally, you can configure processes so it can actually massage the data before passing it on. So we can do, uh, and we'll get onto what CERTS is doing with that uh, in, a little, in a little time. And then it can then dispatch that data to one or more backends. So you can, so if you've, if you've got Zipkin and Jaeger, you, you don't have to choose. You can actually have it go to, to both or off to um, like one of the cloud providers. You can use Google Cloud Tracing or AWS X-Ray. You could use that as your, as your trace store. Um, or of course, uh, the, you know, um, Jaeger is probably the most popular one in the, in the open source world. When, when I was working in a previous role, one of my colleagues was talking a little bit about annotations and making sure that, um, and they were implementing some service, service mesh workloads. Wow, I say that five times fast. <laughs> and they were t talking about uh, annotating that and losing that annotation about halfway through so they didn't get to see that full traceability until they had the aha moment and said like, oh, no, this actually needs to be annotated each step of the way. So as you're passing along this thread or this call, that's something that you have to be mindful of. And with that, I'd like to transition into where it is that you work, you know, talking a little bit about asserts, what you're doing with Otel and Prometheus. But really, I'd love to hear first about um, what are you doing at asserts? What, what's, the what's the company focused on? What's your mission and vision? What, what are you working on? Yeah, so as I said, we're working on providing a, a layer of, of, of intelligence and automation on top of these great open source tools. <clears throat> the... Well, by both the founder and, and I previously spent time at, at App Dynamics, and so we've you know, we've both got this background in in APM monitoring observability. Call it call it what you will. I suppose yeah, we had we sort of had this epiphany that there's all these there's all this great open source tooling out here now to collect your observability data. So that's done. Tick. You know, don't, don't reinvent <laughs> the wheel. Why would you do that? Just just use the, the great open source stuff that's that's there. And we realized you know, the, the, the problem is then is turning all that data into useful information and doing correlations. We thought, well, how, you know, how can we help help people do that? So we said we built this layer of intelligence and automation on top of these great open source tools that uh, provide that correlation information and also uh, help manage the, the data. So you don't, you're not, not drowning in data. You, we, we, uh, we distill the data down. Um, so yeah, I sort of talk about, if we just talk about the sort of the metric side of things first. So you, you really got, got two use cases for the metrics. You know, you're in the short term, you want as much as possible for troubleshooting. So in case anything goes wrong, you want fine grain metrics on absolutely everything. But because it's expensive to keep that long term, because the other use case, of course, you have is for long term analysis and reporting. You know, we, we've got a CI/CD pipeline. We're throwing out release after release after release. It'd be useful to know if we're making things better or worse. You know, are these services getting faster and less error prone, or are they getting slower and more error prone? <laughs> so you, you want to you want to have that long term data for that analysis. So what you don't want to do, of course, is is keep everything forever because well, hey, Prometheus doesn't really like it, and it becomes very cumbersome to try and run a big a big Prometheus with yeah, storing everything forever. So we've essentially automated that. We, we take your existing Prometheus, which is typically fifteen days of retention. Uh, if you're still if you're tr still troubleshooting after fifteen days, you've got other problems. <clears throat> so we take that. So we essentially do queries on that data, uh, run it through a set of rules, and then uh, store low cardinality data long term. So it would probably knock the data volume down to about two, by about to about ten percent of what it was. So then it's really easy, or relatively easy, to store that long term. So then you can still do your trend analysis. Hey, you know, have we made this service better? Are there more errors, less errors? Is it going faster? Is it going slower? And also for customer metrics, you know, are, are people buying more? Are they buying less? Is, is customer engagement getting better as performance improves? 
I like that. And, and, and I like what you said around just storing the right data and actually being actionable on it, right? I think that uh, when it comes to, you know, if, if I fill my garage with all of these things or packages, or if I just keep pushing things into there because it's important, uh, okay, that's great. But then I've filled up my garage and I can't park my car there or <laughs> use the same analogy with the closet or any kind of room. But, yeah. um, you know, if I just pulled in all of the mail, that would include my junk mail too. So I, I like that you're taking the time to focus on making this data actionable and really being able to focus on that. Yeah, the other, the other thing we do to help people get started like i said earlier it's really easy to stand up prometheus set up a bunch of uh, collectors and exporters scrape config and if you if you're using prometheus operating kubernetes it's even easier so you yeah you've got this data but you've got no real way of understanding and visualizing it so the asserts product ships with a curated library of pre-built dashboards and health rules for all common technologies. So from day one, you can be you can be effective. You know, you, you can actually uh, be productive and start using the data you're collecting without having to spend weeks or months building dashboards and writing health rules. Of course, yeah, it's not going to be one size fits all. There's always going to be some uh, some uniqueness to each environment. So of course, you can still write your still write your own and the dashboarding we, we're building again just leverage the open source we're built we embed grafana in the product so if you have some favorite grafana dashboards you're not saying goodbye to those you can it is grafana you can just import them and if you tag them correctly they will also appear in the right place contextually as well so you don't have to go hunting for them that's that's really helpful and i think that folks would be overjoyed to hear that it's like hey we can save you a couple of weeks or months of time um, even for folks that are uh, that have implemented OpenTelemetry and Prometheus and, and Grafana, these other tools, um, do you help leverage making their stacks better? I've, I've definitely heard, like I I won't name who, but I have heard folks say, "Hey, we set this up four years ago, and we really haven't touched these rules since." Uh, is that another kind of uh, problem case that you help solve for? Uh, yeah. So. Say we it's a curated library, so each each new release there may be updates to the to the rules as things change, and you get you get different you know, newer releases of the software components you're running, and so they maybe behave slightly differently. Uh, so yeah, those rules are constantly tweaked and, uh, and massaged uh, to, to be to be the most effective. Like I say, you always have that ability to override and and tweak and tune or disable a one of our health rules if it's nagging you if you think oh well, actually i don't need this this is fine in my <laughs> environment uh, you know i don't care about that you can you can you know, squelch it down and uh, turn it off and say if you've got unique things it might be in your environment there's a particularly important message queue and if the queue depth is greater than five oh dear we're in trouble so that's a very unique rule to you hey yeah you can just add that in there and uh, you'll get you'll get notified about it I think that's helpful to you is, is being able to focus on a great point about alert fatigue, right? You know, like you're notified every time you get a sale, you're like, no, that's a good thing. I can look at that <laughs> in a different way. Yeah. I don't need to get bugged about that at three in the morning. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, the way we handle that is, yeah, <clears throat> as you know, there's, there's in any large system, there's always something running a little hot, going a little slower. So uh, you get this constant chatter of, of alert notifications and the vast majority of them probably aren't actually that important. There may be something that can be tuned later, but you certainly don't want to be woken up at three o'clock in the morning to say, hey, you know, CPU consumption on this container was a little hot for a minute. Oh, who cares? <laughs> so, so, the, so the way we manage that is to really operationalize SLOs. It's a, it's a partly, hopefully everybody's read the SRE handbook or at least flicked through it. And so SLOs are a <laughs> yeah. Do you know what it, do you know what the acronym stands for? So service level. Uh, <laughs> so the the idea then is you you set up the SLOs and the things that are that are important. Like you know, users must be able to log in in, in less than five hundred milliseconds, or you know, payments got to go through in less than three hundred milliseconds. Whatever. So, so you or uh, the error ratio on a on the integration with a shipping service or you know, anything like that, you can set up SLOs against it. So 
And of course, that that service, there'll be a bunch of other software components underneath that make that happen. So there you know, could be a dozen microservices underneath there and some data stores and some caches that are all making it happen. Now, they can all be having little issues, little bits where they run a little hot or a little slow. But if it doesn't impact that overall SLO, then we're not going to alert you. We still record that those things happened, but you're not going to get that you know, emergency page or a Slack message or whatever at, uh, at four o'clock in the morning uh, telling you to panic. Only if the, if the SLO is in danger of breaching or has actually breached. So we, we, we monitor the, the SLO burn down. And if we see a rapid uh, acceleration in burn rate, we try and sort of rather than wait for it to smash through and, and head off to the hills uh, as it starts accelerating, they're going to issue an alert and say, hey, this SLO is looking shaky. You might want to take a look at this. I've, I've seen folks implement some uh, alerting, implement SLOs and have some you know, key metrics or key uptime deliverability and reliability factors that they're trying to aim for, though they will set monitors and alerts on uh, objectively the wrong thing. And like you said, this container was running hot for two minutes, but Kubernetes is going to reap that and bring it back anyway. So it's not that much of an issue or um, it's, or the auto scaler just hasn't kicked on yet to kind of adjust for mm -hmm. this influx of traffic that we're looking at. So I think that's been uh, those, uh, again, have hours of those stories, many, many fun, <laughs> many yes, fun yes. moments in retrospect, not in the moment at all. But um, I think for folks looking at uh, those kinds of, you know, implementing monitoring and alerting, but making sure it's the right kind as well, that's also really helpful. And it sounds like you have yeah, there's, uh, there's sort of a, there's another layer then on top of that. So really, one of the really clever things and I don't understand how they do it. It's some very clever engineers that wrote it all. But one of the very clever things we do is analyze all the, the, the metric labels. You know, so Prometheus metric obviously has its value, but it has a whole bunch of labels describing what the metric's about. So we analyze those metric labels and similarly traces have tags, which is the metadata about, about the trace. It's not just the timing. So we analyze the trace tags so from that, we can build up a graph database of how everything's interconnected. So it's not just service to service, that's what tracing gives you, but it's, it's also the stack that it's running on. So I like to think of it as a, as a four dimensional graph of your application topology. So it's service to service, which is your X to Y, the stack, which is your Z, the depth, and then we record it all over time. So at any single point in time, we know what was talking to what and where it was running. So when there's an incident, so your, your, your SLO goes bad and you're, oh, no, users are taking 1.2 <laughs> seconds never to happened. log in, you know, and we, we didn't want that. We definitely wanted it at 500 milliseconds or less. So what went wrong? So without that graph, you're then relying on your maybe your own knowledge to know that, hey, this user service uses this database and this cache and, and piecing it together that way or having to ask a colleague that, hey, you know, the certs has done this for you. It will, when that instance generated, it automatically traverses that graph database and collates everything together onto one dashboard. So everything, all the information you need to troubleshoot that incident is just right there. You're not rummaging around, fishing for stuff and asking <laughs> colleagues and, you know, Every, everybody loves a good scavenger hunt, especially with their metrics and trying to figure things out. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it, that's a great point. When when SLOs, you know, go bad or you, even if you don't break an SLO and you had a really impactful event and your team was still kind of scrambling to meet that SLO, um, do you have any tools or, or features available to help out with that root cause analysis or, or anything like that? Yeah, like I said, so when that incident happens, uh, so we say, okay, well, that login service, it's now taking a lot longer than, than our target of our, of our SLO. So that generates, that generates an incident. And so you'll get notified. You, you use, we just use standard Prometheus Alert Manager. So that can, whatever hooks into that, you, you know, all the usual uh, candidates there, page of duty and the like. So you'll get, you'll get notified. So then you can go in to the dashboard and as I say, on that one dashboard, it looks so. The the SLO was against 
an endpoint on the user service, but that user service has dependencies. Yeah, it obviously runs somewhere. If, if we take Kubernetes, it's a service, so there's a pod, and then that pod will be running on a node within a within a cluster. But that service may use a cache, it may use a database, it may call a whole load of other things. There could be like you know easily a dozen services, a dozen microservices involved in that. So you know which one's causing the problem, or which more than one is causing the the problem. So you want to be able to go and investigate and check everything out. And as I said, this the graph database we've we've built understands all those relationships, all those service to service and the stack. So what it does, it traverses that database and pulls in everything that's immediately connected uh, <clears throat> around it and puts all that onto onto a one dynamic dashboard for you. So you're not having to fish around trying to find out what's uh, you know what's going on where and also any of those dependent services if they've had any issues they're highlighted as well so you can see that maybe it's not actually our user service itself it's reliant on this mongo database and this mongo database was running a little slow so then you can go and investigate hey why was why was mongo a little slow because it's running out of resource or whatever like I love it when it's just a, uh, a capped resource kind of problem. Yeah, it's much yeah. less fun with it. <laughs> it's like, oh, this yeah, the null type of define. What is what is going on? Yeah, um, yeah, good old yeah. That's an easy example. I'm yeah, there's a lot more that can go wrong than that, as I'm sure we all know. <laughs> and and great to have that telemetry to to dive deeper. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Uh, for folks that uh, have any questions, I'd love to urge you to throw those into chat and. We can get to those. I, I think I've got a couple more going, but uh, we'd love to hear from all of you and we can get some more questions answered. Yeah, I'd say <clears throat> the worst way is on that theme of, of then troubleshooting. So you'd say you've, you've got all your metrics and, and all the dashboards immediately accessible from that, uh, from that dynamically created dashboard. But equally from there, you can then jump out into logs. So you've got your existing logging solution. Maybe you've got an Elk stack. We'll, we'll jump out to Elk and you'll arrive in Elk uh, with, a, with a deep link. So the, the time range and the search query is already filled in for you. So you're straight away looking at the appropriate container logs or subsystem logs, whatever it happens to be that, uh, that's linked across. And then the same thing with the tracing. And we do a really quite a clever thing with the tracing. As I said, we, we have a, an, our own hotel collector module and, we, and we're using that for, for two purposes, really. So first of all, we're analyzing all the trace tags. So that so we're essentially that creates, uh, that, that hotel collector that we've got, creates a bunch of Prometheus metrics from all the spans that it sees, and they get, they get reaped in. So that gives us, that helps us build our, our graph. But also we're looking at the timings. So we're building baselines, multi-period baselines for each endpoint. So therefore we know whether an endpoint, whether a particular call to an endpoint is normal or not. You know, is it slower than normal uh, or was it normal? Because if you think about it, you know, ideally you know, most of your requests will be handled in a prompt and error-free manner. You know, they won't be interesting. There'll be a perfectly normal request that came through not a problem at all. And you're really generally not that interested in those. It's only the slow and error ones you want to go and you want to go and delve into and go, oh, well, why did this one go wrong? And if you think if you've got an SLO of 99%, that means in the worst case scenario, you're only expecting 1% of those traces to be interesting, you know, to be slow or erroneous. So hell, you know, why am I trying to collect all of them or 10% of them? So, <clears throat> so what our hotel collector does it then, having sent all its metrics up, it then calls and pulls down the baseline information. So it knows for each endpoint that it sees uh, when a span comes in, if that's if that's slower than normal or not. And therefore, if it's if it's an interesting one, if it's slow or erroneous, it passes it through to the back end. And if it's just a regular one, then we just drop it. And because we hey, we don't we don't need to fill our storage up with all these perfect traces. So that. You know, you know, taking the 99% SLO type per uh, argument, uh, that's going to reduce your stored traces you know, down to 1% of, of trace volume, uh, which is a good thing. And in fact, if you're using cloud storage, it will quite often sneak you into the free tier, which is even better.
<laughs> always always helpful when you can actually make use of the free tier it's like oh okay yeah. good i came in under the, the limits on that front. Yeah. i i like i like that you you talked a little bit about elk stack as well and and i'd like to focus on that data collection strategy and so so does that mean you don't necessarily have to change it with open telemetry and with prometheus can you keep your same measures and measurements that you used to have yeah, absolutely. Um, the, so the idea is we, we sit, if you've already implemented open source, great, well done. Uh, we love you. And we just sit on top of what you've already done. So we just providing that layer of, uh, of intelligence and automation to make your life easier on top of the hard work you've already done and freeing you from having to manage and maintain hundreds of dashboards. You'll probably be able to knock that down to just a, a handful of very specific ones to your business. Uh, the rest of the rest of the commodity dashboards, we've we've done that for you. And the same thing with those with those health rules. And we also, you know, same we we solve that real problem of of how do you correlate across a distributed system, and how do you how do you go from one service to another, and from traces to logs, and back to metrics, and you know how do you, how do you manage all of that? Well, hey, you know, we're, we're doing that for you. I think that's one of the most painful things that I've dealt with in, in uh, other roles and responsibilities is having to, uh, being told that, you know, like, okay, you have to rip out everything that you have installed and you install this new operator and <laughs> nope, you have to use our agent and everything like that. It's so much nicer to be able to leverage what already exists and then it makes it an easier adoption path, at least in my experience. So yeah, I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, that's what the, I think the open source tooling is all is all about is you can, you can, implement these great open source tools and you're you're not tied in anywhere you uh, you can you can use that data wherever you want uh, and you can choose to to send it off to uh, some licensed uh, cloud software company or you, know, you can you can use a one of the big cloud providers as a service, you know, Prometheus as a service, or the big cloud providers do that, or you can run it yourself. The freedom is yours. You can choose to do with it uh, what you want. And that's definitely our philosophy. You know, we're not saying hey, all that hard work you've done with open source, rip it out and start again, install our agent. No, <laughs> we, want, we, we just want to sit on top of your data that you've already got and just allow you to do a lot more with it. I understand. Less I understand it's a lot more job security to keep rewriting it, but it's very <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Amazing. I, I think one thing that helps too is that uh, it's, I, I, I took a look at a search site and one thing I thought that was interesting was the intelligent sampling that you have, because that's a core concern of what a lot of people focus on, especially yeah, right yeah. now with workforce reductions and everything else is what's the cost. And so by utilizing things like that and Prometheus and open telemetry, can you, Talk to some of those cost-cutting concerns that, that kind of come into play. Yeah, like I said, by doing the intelligence sampling of those traces, you're going to significantly reduce the amount of, amount of storage you need. You're like, traces are big, and there's a lot of them. If, you're, if, you, if you turn the dial up, if you, if you try and collect a lot, if you try, it's one of those, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a horrible balancing act, because if you collect all the traces, there's a lot of them and it's really expensive. You've got egress charges. Uh, if you're sending them somewhere, you'll certainly break through the free tier of that cloud provider. So you've got big bills for the, for the storage. If you're running it yourself, you, you've got to scale up a, a big Cassandra cluster to store all that data. And again, you're going to be burning through, through storage space. So, and but then if you go the other way and turn it right down, then you know, as I say, Murphy's law clearly states the traces you want are the traces that you didn't sample. So, what's the point of doing tracing in the in the first place? You know, <laughs> the thing you really really wanted it for, oh, didn't get that. So, yeah, doing that intelligent sampling is the best of both worlds. It's uh, it's going to really really compress your data down, so you don't have the cost associated with trying to process and store all those traces. But having compressed it down, you've still got the really interesting ones. When you're trying to, when you're trying to do that problem solving, why didn't that work? Where did that go? Why did that? What through that error? You can go and you can go and open the trace up, and you've got all those all those interesting ones. You haven't thrown it away so yeah murphy gets frustrated at that point 
<laughs> uh, he'll have to write a law. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, my, my last question, then uh, we'd love to tie it up and, and talk a little bit more about any calls to action or, or you know, any things that, that you'd like to point out with the certs. But when it comes to understanding the relationship between your data and automating that correlation, um, are there any tips, tricks, or, or things that the certs offer that help out with that when it comes to open telemetry and from APS? As I said, yeah, that, you know, that graph database that we build by analyzing the, the metric tags and the, the tracing tags to build up that relationship model so we know what services are talking to what and where they're running. And that, uh, you know, that makes your, your life a lot easier. You're not relying on that tribal knowledge. You, know, you, you, know, you might be trouble, you, know, you might be an engineer, you might be trying to troubleshoot a payment gateway, but you're dependent on a bunch of other services and they're giving you some troubles. So, oh, right, but I don't know how they're deployed. Uh, so then you've got to call somebody else in and then they're going, oh yeah, but that uses this database thing, but I know nothing about that. So I've got to call somebody else in and suddenly your war room's got half the company in it. And because if, you're, if you've got all your engineers in a war room trying to head scratch and figure out a problem, then they're not doing really what the organization's primarily paying them for, which is writing new features and fixes. So there's a big cost to the, to the organization there. And also, you know, most programmers I know prefer to write code than debug code. So <laughs> they, they, get, they get a bit frustrated. So having the system automate a lot of that donkey work for you is, uh, you know, again, is a big boon. It's, it's both in, in sort of productivity and sort of the, in, and the intangibles is, you know, happy engineers. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't agree more with wanting to kind of jump more so into the code and less, you know, focus on the, uh, you know, I, I like the idea of code, but uh, <laughs> writing useful code is always more helpful. I think uh, some, some interesting things I've seen within the community are like the open telemetry demo, which I'll, I'll link in the chat for folks. Um, many different programming languages and options to start understanding what's possible with open mm -hmm. telemetry. And then, you know, you can tie that together with something like asserts or uh, crafting up a dashboard that's really helpful for you. But I like that the community is focused on providing an actual use case of how to put these things together. So it's not just wishing you well and kind of leaving you, you know, in the wind to figure this out on your own. Um, yeah, a lot of it's pretty easy. I've done, I've done a little bit my, myself in various languages with, with open telemetry. And, you know, it's, it's not actually that onerous to do because... These, there's quite a lot of automation around the open telemetry libraries. It's uh, it, if you, you know, some things you don't have to change a line of code. It's just how you just a startup parameter. But if you do change code, you're talking like six lines. It's yeah, yeah it's not a lot of work. And I think having that ability to link together all of those different types of telemetry to like your logs and traces and, mm -hmm. and different application stack, you know, uh, uh, stack overflows, those kinds of things really helpful. Yeah. Uh, not stack overflow, copy paste service. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, where most, that's where most bugs come from. So I think someone did some, <laughs> did some analysis that there was an incorrect snippet of code on stack overflow and it was, it was found in like 500 projects across the internet or something. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I forgot to remove example.com. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, for folks looking to get started with asserts and just read more about you, uh, do you have any information on that front? Yeah, absolutely. Go to If you go to the asserts website, which is asserts.ai, and there's lots of useful information on this and great blogs around how to actually use Prometheus and how to, how to set it up and get the collectors all going and the, and the same with with Otel and the the other thing to have a have a great little play with we have a sandbox environment on the website uh, so go in there and you can you it's read only but so see so you don't break it for everybody else but you're free to click around and and have a look and see how asserts builds on top of these great open source tools to and really sort of glue it all together and, and make your life a lot easier I love that. I always love when you can test something out before you actually go to purchase it and just get a better idea of how to work with it. Yeah. Well, um, if you wanted to go even further, you can actually uh, run asserts for free forever. This, we have a, a free version. 
So you can go and in install it yourself. If you just want a quick play around, probably the quickest and easiest way to do it is there's a Docker Compose for it. So you, you can you can run it up on a reasonably meaty developer's laptop or a, spin a VM up in a cloud somewhere and just point it at your existing Prometheus and it'll query the data, give it a, give it a minute or two and everything will light up. Obviously, if you're going to do uh, a more serious production install, uh, you know, running it on Docker Compose isn't perhaps the best way of doing it. There's a Helm chart, so you can deploy it into, into Kubernetes, and then you have all the benefits that Kubernetes gives you of scalability and self-healing and the like. Amazing. I, I, again, just love that accessibility and the fact of being able to give folks the option to just give things a test spin and dive a little bit more deeply into what's possible for them. So. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, I don't see any more questions rolling in. And with that, uh, we'd love to give a final call for that. But uh, otherwise, with that, uh, Steve, do you have any parting thoughts, wisdoms, mantras, or, or anything else that you'd like to share before we, start, we spin down today? Uh, no, I think we've, think we've covered everything that I can think of. So, yeah, it's been great having a chat. Uh, hopefully, awesome. hopefully our audience learned something useful and they'll all go to assert and read some blog posts and have a play in the sandbox. Uh, my, my passing word of wisdom is uh, make sure that your computer is turned on. Uh, that usually <laughs> fixes it for me. <laughs> okay. right, so you've got to turn it off, then turn it on. <laughs> it's like, ah, yes, there's yes. A, a good podcast I'll to link to later that uh, somebody went into like for an hour about the deep mechanics of why that actually works and state machines and everything else. But yeah. it's a, another fun conversation for another time. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today on this live stream. We hope to catch you again. And uh, until we see you again, keep your head in the clouds. We'll catch you around. Okay, thanks. Adios. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve and Taylor. Thank you, thank you.